This week, I'm gonna get that fender flare installed, and instead of this off-road look, it's gonna look like this. Garage time. My name is Tom, and welcome to Garage Time. You know, this channel is about inspiring you to build your dream car. I'm working on this Porsche Restaurant project that started out as a stripped out and wrecked shell. And I'm making progress every week in this small two car garage. So please, if you like these videos, please subscribe now, hit that like button. Let's build this together. Thank you again for all your suggestions on undercoating removal. I was able to get some big chunks off. Now this was at the top, uh, right here at the quarter window. This undercoating was uh, failing. Now is the time with better access with the fender removed to go in there and, and chisel that stuff off. And what I found that worked best was kind of a combination of the re methods you recommended. I, uh, I used the paint stripper and I left it for several hours. Actually, I left it overnight. And because this material is so soft, it tends to soak in and just really create a, like a brittle sort of stuff. And so I was able to use the putty knives. I used some plastic putty knives, a couple of metal putty knives. Some of it, about 80% of it just chisels off. And then the remaining bits was done with, with the wire wheel on the angle grinder. And that works pretty quickly. The angle grinder will power through fresh undercoating, but it's just kind of dusty and uh, takes longer. So if you break it up with the putty knife in the, in the uh, aircraft stripper, it, it, it's not that bad. I mean, it's a messy job, but it's not that bad. So I will have some more work to do to replace this failed undercoating, and I'll show you a picture underneath. Okay, this is underneath the rear fender well, and uh, this is the area that was failing. The undercoating was failing, it was cracked, and I was able to just chip it out with my putty knife. Now the good news is this car hasn't been driven in probably 10 to 15 years. So even though the undercoating was cracked, there was no moisture being driven up into it by the wheel. So even though this is ugly, I don't have a lot of rust repair to do. This is all pretty solid. Just needs to be cleaned, epoxy primed, and then re-undercoated. But I'll do a little bit more on that once I uh, am in the undercoating, undercoating mood. Right here, this is the new area that was uh, just wire wheeled with the uh, angle grinder, and it's now shiny metal ready to weld. So let's get to it. Okay, last week I talked about this area here being a little bit mismatched from the new flare, and that's because the new flare, um, when it was cut off the car, was cut a little bit too low. So I don't have enough. So I'm gonna have to modify the car to match the new flare. And I need to stretch it out in this section here. So um, I've just put some Sharpie lines on there where it needs to be stretched. And I also have used my contour gauge to sort of monitor the progress as it gets stretched. So this technique is known as hammer on dolly. And that ringing sound you hear is what you want because you're actually compressing the metal between the heavy dolly this is my heaviest dolly and my heaviest hammer and and every time you hit it it takes the metal and stretches it it pushes it out so when you push it out it's going to mushroom this way Okay, you can see some daylight underneath the contour gauge. It's already moving quite a bit. So I'm gonna go a little bit further and, um, and then I'm gonna start welding and then finishing the contour once it's tacked in place. Okay, you can see the hammer marks there in the metal. So I know exactly where I've hit it. And this doesn't dent the metal at all. Um, as long as you have good control with the hammer and you're hitting the dolly right, it doesn't dent anything. It just stretches the metal out. So um, I think that's enough stretching. I'll check it one more time with the contour gauge and then we'll start fitting the uh, flare and tack it in.
Okay, the strategy has been to weld the area that was the exact cut. So if you remember from last time, I cut right through both these panels at the same time. And that means that this is uh, no more adjustment needed right here. So I, I, I've started here. Now I'm coming around to the top and I'm, um, I'm using my reference marks on the bar to double check that I'm in the right ballpark. So what is really important on this flare is that it's at the right height and at the right distance out. And then the curvature, you know, is just based on how it feels. I do have some templates that run off the center, but here's how we go so far. So at the moment, I'm at 226 millimeters and the target was 225. So the height is, is, is very close to where it should be. And uh, this is still overlapping right here in the center. So on the other side, I made a mistake and I cut it too soon before I measured these heights correctly. Um, this time I'm in better shape because I can come back and uh, fine tune this gap to just about zero. The other measurement is the distance um, you know, in and out, so the, the clearance to the wheel. And that's what the plumb bob's for. Okay, the plumb bob is dangling. Here's the target right here. This is the target line right about there. And it is just, it's about a millimeter too far in. So I will cut this tack weld, shift it out a millimeter and, um, and then do the final trim here at the top so that everything is in the correct place. Much easier the second time around. Lunchtime. It's just a little bit after lunch now and I have everything trimmed and gapped and tacked in place. So from the front torsion bar hole all the way back here to the bumper, it is now in its final position. So I'm going to go for the final time and just check that things didn't move too much. Um, yeah. The in and out position from the wheel is, is good and it's the same as the other side. Um, I do have this jacked up a little bit so I get the wheel off, but it's not throwing the measurement off very much. The rear end is sitting about a quarter of an inch higher on this side than the other side, but it's really not throwing off the, uh, the distance here very much. Yeah, the height is 226, which is exactly what it was with the old flare. So the, this position is correct. The line here is correct, so it's centered. And uh, it's basically right, right where I want it to be, which is, which is awesome. I'm really excited. So now I can get this bar out of my way before I impale myself. I'm gonna take it off on both sides. It's just tack welded in. I'm gonna cut that off. I almost forgot something. I was going to show you one more check that I did to verify that the arch is the correct shape. So this being, you know, removed from the car, it's actually a little bit flexible in this direction. So I've taken the, the flare, this is the flare from the uh, passenger side that was um, original to my car. And I'm doing a mirror image and just lining it up to the top crease. And I'm just, you know, the, the profile is different because this is an RS flare, but I'm able to sight along the top and make sure that everything is planar and that there is no, um, 
there's no change in the overall length. So the wheel is always gonna be centered in the car. So I could trace it right down here to the torsion bar hole and it is, um, it's the same exact arch. So this was another good check. I had forgot to do this on the other side, but I've gone back and put this flare over there now. And luckily that one is okay as well. So that means that there's no, um, there's no shrinking in this direction. I don't want this to shrink due to welding or hammering. I don't want this to change. So I'll periodically check it. So I like to use this scale to uh, verify that both panels are lined up across the gap. So th <clears throat> this being flexible, I can bend it into the position and sight along the edges. So I'm doing that. Well, I also wanted to show you guys the dolly I'm using. This is a um, pretty heavy dolly. It's a Martin, Martin dolly. I think the, the number is, is worn off of it now, but this is like what I call the blob. And uh, it, it's pretty heavy. Uh, which is what you want when you're dealing with something that's flexible like this, like this, you know, this is pretty firm, but the sheet metal is so thin that you need something sort of heavy so it doesn't bounce. And then um, depending on the situation with distortion, I will sometimes use this as my hammer. So this is kind of a hammer without a handle. And I don't know, this is a very cheap one, and I think I modified it. There used to be something here on the top, which I think I cut off. So um, you, it's nice because you can put, put it like a, like a knuckle, like a brass knuckle, and then you can um, hit from the backside. So oftentimes what will happen when welding is this will, this will shrink down. So rather than trying to stretch it from this side, it's always a little easier to hammer from the backside. So I can you know, keep this in my right hand and uh, just hit it from the back and back it up with the dolly. So if you listen, That sharp ring is what you want. You wanna be stretching the welds and you wanna be moving metal sort of out if it, if it shrinks down. Sometimes it bulges up. In that case, I will you know, switch it. I'll put this in the back and I'll use the hammer in the front. But uh, I find this tool extremely valuable. I will uh, look for it and leave a link in the description below if you wanna check it out. Okay, at this point, it's just a bunch of welding. Um, connect the dots, so to speak. So I'm going to turn the camera off and spare you all the flashy lights and uh, just get it done, okay? So bear with me. Success at last. Finally, after hours of welding and hammering, I think I got it. Okay, now the next order of business is to grind down these welds. Now, all the distortions have been removed. I've checked it. I don't want to introduce more heat that's gonna warp it, especially in this section right here, which is very flat. So what I do is, uh, and believe it or not, I use a, a cutoff wheel and I grind the, the high points of the weld. I mean, these TIG welds don't have a lot of high points anyways, but um, I just take a quick pass with the edge. So going here on the edge, it's just taking a quick pass. And then the final grinding is done with this, uh, you know, roll lock disc, two inch roll lock disc, about an 80 grit disc. Um, and that's what I use. Nailed it. If you're interested in learning more about the welding, especially TIG welding like I've done here on this flare, I have a video on the screen now to learn more about why I like TIG so much. Also on the screen is a playlist of all my Porsche Resto Mod videos in chronological order so you don't miss any. 
And don't forget to purchase in the description below a t-shirt, coffee mug, stickers, all available to help support Garage Time. I appreciate it and we will see you next week.